When University of Nebraska professor Richard Ferguson looks at a cornfield, he has no illusions. To profitably produce corn in Nebraska, we have to apply nitrogen fertilizer. In many cases, in the past, we applied more than we really needed. Ferguson is seeking the holy grail of crop production, high yields with less environmental impact. He's trying to accomplish that with an experiment he calls Project Sense. Project Sense, at its heart, is encouraging farmers to apply fertilizer during the growing season. Project Sense uses sensor technology to fertilize corn precisely. That saves farmers money and can reduce the chance that excess nitrogen will get into the groundwater. The university team is working to get Project Sense ready for its second trial season in the field. Ferguson knows farmers need to see results. So if we can make them more money by the use of sensor technology, we think that's something they would adopt. Project Sense is being put to the test in areas where groundwater nitrate levels are high. Today, it's at the Syme family farm in central Nebraska. The machine's arms have eight sensors that gauge how much nitrogen the plants need. Then, the computer fires applicators to deliver fertilizer, practically feeding plants one by one. Anthony Syme is riding with John Parrish, the graduate student who drives the applicator. For Anthony, Sense is just another part of his family's goal to use their fertilizer the most efficient way possible. I don't think there's any farmer that wakes up in the morning and says, I'm just gonna go dump a thousand gallons of fertilizer down the ditch. Everybody's trying, it's just that it doesn't always work. There's a lot of things that we can't control, weather being the biggest one. Anthony and his brothers have adopted their father's ideology of progressive farming. Ken Syme says previous generations of farmers didn't think about how excess nitrogen could impact water quality. Like many farmers, he used to put nearly all his fertilizer on the ground before the crops were even planted. Today we apply everything in, we call it spoon feeding, which is a term for just a little bit at a time. Project Sense is the ultimate example of spoon feeding, but Noah Syme says they have good reason to try it. So you can see how much the sand has that fine film of sand on top here has kind of moved around. When the water moves through the soil that freely, it tends to take nutrients with it, whether it be nitrogen or, or whatever, and in our particular area, nitrogen is our big thing that moves in the water. The Symes have a few strategies to slow it down. They practice no-till farming and plant cover crops to increase organic matter in the soil. These methods help control erosion and keep water and nutrients in the root zone of the plants for longer. You're not irrigating as much. You know, you're not, you're also not leaching away. If you're holding that moisture in place rather than just letting it go through, we know that we're doing a better job of holding everything in place. The Symes also have another way to spoon feed crops that's less precise, but also less expensive than Project Sense. It's called chemigation or fertigation. It uses a center pivot hooked up to a fertilizer tank. Now, the Symes are fertilizing their plants as they water them. Ken Syme and his sons sell precision irrigation equipment to other farmers too. Because margins are tight, the Symes say farmers have to adopt new technologies and strategies to make the most of their water, fertilizer, and seeds. You're either gonna get on the train and go with it, or you're gonna get left behind. Across the Missouri River in Iowa, you won't find center pivots, but you will find the same battle to slow erosion and the loss of fertilizer. Dick Sloan, a farmer in eastern Iowa near Cedar Rapids, doesn't have sandy soils. Here, farmers have installed systems of underground pipe that help drain excess water off fields. The soil needs to have a proper drainage, and if they don't have that, the crops suffer dramatically. So tile has been one way that we learned how to farm these soils productively. But tiles drain directly into nearby streams and rivers, often carrying fertilizer and pesticides with the water. This kind of field runoff isn't regulated, and Iowa has some of the worst water pollution in the Midwest. Sloan is well aware of this. 
he uses no-till and cover crops to keep the movement of fertilizer to a minimum. If I'm, you can see how everything's kind of knitted together. It's still hooked on. He's also focused on slowing down rainwater. Cover crops help, as do planting prairie strips. The idea here is that as water moves down across the field, it encounters this contoured strip across the field that stop any residue from getting through there and, and help filter the water better. Sloan uses the same seeds and tools as other commercial crop farmers. But he says he likes to think of his farm as an example of what's possible to reduce agriculture's environmental impact. We could grow excellent crops and keep those nutrients cycling and have less water getting polluted as it goes down to the Cedar River and then on down to the Mississippi and down to the Gulf. So that's the hope. Sloan has worked with former Iowa Extension agent Chad Ingalls to develop his solutions. Ingalls has worked on numerous farmer-led projects on impaired watersheds in northeast Iowa. One new tool that Ingalls has helped farmers try out is something you can't see. It's called a bioreactor. So water from this field would normally dump right out into this ditch behind us, but we have it go through this structure, and there's a set of gates on the inside that diverts it into the bioreactor that's underneath this grassy area. And the bioreactor is just a trench that's 100 feet long and 30 feet wide, and it's filled with wood chips. The nitrate-laden water that passes through the bed of wood chips gets cleaned by microbes that turn the nitrates back into nitrogen gas. I think almost every field needs some kind of practice, whether it's a bioreactor, no-till, just better nitrogen and phosphorus management. It's going to take a wide range of things. Ingle says all these strategies and tools will be successful if farmers can get the education and support they need. If that practice doesn't make sense, they're probably going to try something different. But if that practice is profitable and sustainable in the long run, they're going to stick with it. Craig Cox with the Environmental Working Group in Ames, Iowa, agrees that bioreactors and prairie strips work. But he says many farmers aren't using them enough. Otherwise, the water would be in a lot better shape than it is. The federal government has spent more than $3 million to support measures that reduce water pollution from Iowa farms. But Cox says voluntary measures don't work. If you can voluntarily install a practice, you can also voluntarily take it out. His group did a study to measure the use of two of those common practices and found that over a five-year period, the net gain was negligible. You know, here's the good news story. We got a buffer, a new buffer, but here's the bad news story, right? We had a buffer, now we don't have one anymore. To really solve the water quality challenge, Cox says we should establish a set of mandatory conservation practices, like the ones farmers already use now. Maybe that list is not the right list everywhere. But the point is we think there really has to be a list. And, and it's not optional. But Dick Sloan says regulation isn't the way to go. People have a natural negative reaction to regulation. Anybody would. It's not just farmers are just so much like everybody else. It's going to take time for them to question what they're doing. Farmers are very independent, but the reality is, is it, it needs to be something that we pay attention to because water quality, the nitrate in the water, can be a very detrimental thing to humans. If we won't be stewards ourselves, someone will have to help us be a steward. So what's the solution? It depends on who you ask, but probably some combination of technology, on-farm stewardship, regulation, and cooperation among many different players. We certainly can't fault our predecessors for managing the best they knew how at the time. It's incumbent on us today, I think, to use, take advantage of the technologies we have today to use those as best we can. And this is a solvable problem. It's just everyone has to do their part. A lot of people are like, oh, I've been doing this this way for 30 years and I'm not going to change now. And that attitude will not last for our children and grandchildren. You know, we're going to have to adapt.